Thank you. Thanks, everybody. It was a very inspiring morning session. Uh, so here I will uh, talk about uh, business model analysis. It's more of an application talk. And uh, uh, the work I've uh, uh, been doing for maybe many, many years, starting in Microsoft Research. I continued that work at eBay Research. And then some of the work uh, now I'm putting in practice uh, as a part of uh, this company I founded, uh, FERA. Uh, we'll talk more about FERA later. Uh, so a lot of co-authors. Especially I'd like to thank Steve Tedlis. I have many, many discussions with him on various many things. Uh, so let's see. So business model analysis. So people know like business models are important. Uh, so this is... Uh, when Coke used to be served in fountain, they changed it uh, bottle, and that's a basically a big jump for them. Uh, now it's one of the biggest brands. Uh, so note that it's not just the business model; it's also the user experience which was changed. Uh, the places which you can consume Coke, the way you can consume Coke uh, is changed. So a good business model aligns well uh, with the user experience. Okay. Uh, so this is typically like an innovation pyramid in, in companies. Like you have to uh, do day-to-day -day operations. That's most important. Most of your people are here. Then, of course, technology. You need to keep uh, improving your processes, your products. That's uh, next. But these two itself is not what serves the customer. The customer cares about user experience, how they are going to experience your product. And uh, to have a best user experience, you need to make money. So these two things go hand in hand. So there has to be tight integration uh, between business models and user experiences. Okay. So another thing is, how many of you know Play for Sure? <coughs> Zero. That's what I expected. Uh, so Play for Sure um, is uh, was Microsoft technology in competition with iTunes. Uh, this was uh, started in uh, early. 2000 or 2001, maybe, and nobody knows about it. Uh, it was a bad business model. It was a basically um, like a, a business model which was also suggested by a top name economist who came and gave talks to Microsoft executives. It's, it was a two sided uh, business model where one side will be all the music sellers, all the websites which sells music, and the other side will be all the hardware players who make like Samsung. Sony, so they make hardware players. As long as you buy a um, song from, uh, 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 from a participant of Play For Sure technology, you can play it on a, uh, on a Play For Sure uh, uh, hardware. So it was a very good, strong network effect. The problem here is, is uh, the user experience. It has to compromise the user experience a lot. The difference between a computer, which is also another two-sided market, is that on a computer, as a Turing machine, you can come up with everyday new and new user experiences. So, so it makes sense that uh, both sides are richer. But a music player only plays music. So it was a sort of a uh, bad interaction between user experience and business model. Search ads, how many you know search ads? <laughs> OK, so one person knows search ads. So on the other hand, this is a. This is an example of a very good alignment of uh, user experience and business model. Uh, on Google, you go, and what is the user experience? Click and go to another website. What is the business model? Click and go to another website. Uh, it's just the, uh, the back end, how one is paid and one is free, which changes, but uh, it's a very good alignment. And, and you can see a huge company built around this. So one question people ask is, oh, what's the difference between uh, business model and, let's say, pricing? The difference is the pricing is about how much to charge for an event, but business model is to come up with what event to charge with. How do you actually uh, make money? Okay. So given we have uh, connectivity all the time um, and all the technology, all the sensors, all the everything, now we have a choice of multitude of business model. Traditionally, before all this smartphone, et cetera, there were like a handful of business models. Are you going to rent? Are you selling? And, and all those handful of business models. But now you can have a lot of things, like cost per click. Without technology, such a business model was not possible. Okay. The challenge for us is 
we, it's very hard to predict upfront which business will be good, which business model will be bad. It's more of a uh, art. So people get to know, oh yeah, I know it's so obvious. After it has been proven successful or after it has been proven failure. Uh, so you don't have a lot of data to um, analyze those business models and even mathematical tools are probably not sufficient. Uh, so what are, what are the ingredients? If I'm trying to like, if I analyze business models, um, so what are the ingredients which goes in? One is uh, the risk. So risk actually plays two ways. So it's, first of all, it makes the complexity. So if I am a, a common user, I'd, if you offer me a risky proposition, I don't know how to handle it. So it will be a bad business. Uh, for example, uh, if uh, eBay were to charge per click and I have to sell, sell one computer, that's all I have, then I'm taking a huge risk. I might get 10 clicks, build for 10 clicks, and then my problem is still in hand. So people, uh, whenever there's a risk, it becomes a complicated thing. Uh, the other thing I already talked about, the user experience, the decision making uh, must be very easy in, in any kind of good business model. Uh, so there are other um, um, ingredients one can study, uh, uh, like uh, certain psychological biases uh, people have, rent versus own, uh, given the same equal value proposition, people usually prefer owning it. Uh, there are other things you can study in business models like government regulations. Many of them are outdated for the internet world, so one can actually use the arbitrage there. Uh, so let me give you one toy example first. This is uh, work done at Microsoft Research uh, uh, with Nikhil and Swen. Uh, so there's this uh, highway. This is now more popular business experience in, in many places called hot lanes, uh, where there's a paid lane and a free lane on a highway. The free is uh, whatever the traffic is, you can just travel. On the paid lane is, uh, you have to pay for it, and the amount they charge changes uh, almost uh, hourly basis, depending upon how much the traffic is. Now imagine you are a driver, and uh, you see that, oh, it's flashing uh, sometimes like 75 cents, sometimes flashing like $6. How do you make a decision? Is it a, is it a good buy to, to travel on a 75 cents? Maybe not, because the free lane itself is flowing very well. Is it a good buy if it's, a, it's $6 flashing for use it for a couple of miles? Um, actually, it's very hard for most uh, drivers to make uh, a, a good decision in the current user experience. On the other hand, if let's say they were to implement a pay for performance business model, they say that uh, our highways uh, toll lanes are priced $6 an hour, very low money. So they could say, if you believe your time is more than uh, $6 an hour uh, worth, use the uh, toll lane. If your current time is worth uh, less than $6 an hour, use the free lane. And at the end of the, uh, when you start using the toll lane, and when you come out of it, we can measure how much time you saved and just bill it accordingly. If you save 15 minutes, uh, so this paper actually come up uh, from a friend experience who was driving on this highway, and uh, he took the toll lane because the free lanes were jam-packed, but after a mile, even the toll lane was jam-packed, he paid $1.25. He said, damn, I mean, if I knew I wasted $1.25. I said, you said that you drive one mile, but in that one mile, you probably jumped 500 cars and may have saved like uh, 20 minutes. Oh. So, so that's kind of uh, decision making uh, you can solve by good business models. Of course, everybody uh, knows uh, uh, iTunes. It was a flat fee when it started. Uh, still, there are like two, three different fees. Can I ask a question? Sure. So, I don't know what uh, toll road you are talking about, but there is a toll road like this from uh, Jerusalem to Tel Aviv mm -hmm. uh, that, that the entrance fee varies and it flashes above this. Yes. And as best I understand from my Israeli friends, it's super popular. They like it. So they view the current version as a, you know, it's simple. There's a number there and you make a decision. And it, it's viewed as a good experience. I don't know why, what evidence you have that it's not a good experience. First of all, um, uh, it sounds expensive. So I gave you one example. 
like you can see the uh, suboptimality. There, you see the toll lane completely free, getting wasted, and the free lanes are all jam packed. This is you can see all the time. Uh, so the, it is parallel lanes, free and toll side by side, and you can just observe it. And then I can observe it. And I, yeah. So maybe at some places it's a. It's a I lived there for a semester, and yeah. uh, my friend thought that it was a wonderful invention for enough money, you can go in the normal speed. Now, you can decide it's not a good invention, but I think saying that it's not a good experience. No, I'm not saying good experience. No. It's, it's, it's better experience than um, um, all being uh, free, but there could be a better experience. That's what I'm saying. The decision making is even easier here. Uh, if we were to pay for performance, people would not have regret after using it. And many times people do have regret, oh, I wish I was in toll lane, because the, they realize too late that the free lane is so jam-packed, and or vice versa. So the equilibriums are different here, and uh, better equilibriums. Uh, so this we already know. Uh, so let me um, go through uh, the uh, things we can talk about, uh, maybe not all of it. Uh, so there are some of the business models these companies use. eBay uses the commission model, 10% fee of whatever you make on eBay. Google is cost per click. Then Best Buy is a markup model where they get the inventory from the suppliers um, and then mark up the prices and then sell it that prices. And Costco is an interesting one. They essentially uh, make profit when you sign up for the membership fee. And after that, they try to make uh, between 0 to 2% on the goods they sell. Uh, so it's essentially, you can say, their profitability is membership fee. And after that, they just try to break even. Uh, so Fera, it's a home transaction platform. So uh, we'll come to that last, if the time permits. Uh, so let me give you a model of all these business models. How do we compare? Uh, whether Google business model is better, in what situation, whether eBay's business model is better, whether Costco business model is better, in what situation. So um, let me take a model of intermediary. So this is an intermediary. On one side, they have suppliers. They are different in different contexts. In, in the context of uh, uh, eBay, these are the sellers. In the context of uh, uh, Costco, et cetera, these are the manufacturers of the goods or, or brands of the goods. In, in context of Google, it's the advertisers. And then we have a buyer. Uh, so these suppliers are competing for this buyer's uh, pocket. But these, what we are not modeling here, that buyers, in some situations, buyers can be competing with each other, like, for example, eBay auction. So I'm not counting that model here. So this is the, only the posted price uh, model. Okay. It turns out this model, you can now use it for various situations. Uh, even Walmart, you can use it. Uh, uh, so what the role of intermediary is to facilitate a match between buyer and sellers. That's what it's trying to do uh, in, in various contexts. And, and what resource they have? They usually have a shelf available where they put their products. Okay, this shelf could be a hardware shelf, a real shelf like in a, at Walmart, and it could be a virtual shelf. For example, right inside column on Google, uh, that's a shelf. Uh, and usually you have uh, basically, the shelf uh, have a different uh, sort of attention, if you think ab about it. So at, let's say if I go to Walmart, it's known that uh, things at the uh, shoulder heights are most common. Things uh, at the bottom shelf, they're less common, and for a short person like me, something on the top shelf, as if it doesn't even exist. Okay. So, so you have basically uh, different uh, resources. So this is the shelf for eBay, Google, Walmart. And uh, so how do we compare two businesses, business models, sorry. Uh, so eBay, which has a commission model, would it be better for eBay, let's do, to, to at least certain segment of uh, the market, for, should it offer cost per click model? If it were to do so, would it be good or bad? Okay. So what we do is, um, it's, it's hard to experiment such things, but we can uh, mathematically try to analyze their fundamental properties. Okay. Uh, so, as I said, the difference is, uh, we will we'll drive more theorems about it, but the difference is the cost per click is high risk for the advertisers. I will not sell this computer on Google because I don't want to pay per click price. Okay. 
uh, commission is low risk. It's very easy to sign up. Hey, sign up. If you don't sell anything, don't worry. There's no fee. Uh, so it's easier. <coughs> the, the primary difference when the risk comes is, is the cost per click model is the cost of a click is very similar to some cost. When a click has happened and the user is on your website, at that point, whether you make, whether your selling property is 10%, 50%, 20%, you have paid that money. So you, you want to maximize your transaction probability. Where commission is a uh, sort of a variable cost. Because if you did not close the sale, you didn't have to pay any commission. And as it turns out, the, the, the commission actually shows up in the consumer prices. And then the prices actually goes up on eBay versus uh, if eBay were the uh, cost per click. So it's a mathematical proof. So if you were a per click model, if this is some demand graph, you will be charging this price. And if it were a uh, commission model, you will be charging slightly higher prices. And all three parties are actually uh, slightly worse off. Uh, the buyers get to buy expensive, and uh, the sellers actually have a lower surplus. Uh, let me give you a uh, rather than mathematical proof. Let me give you an illustration. Uh, so let's say you can see how old my slide is. I, I think the popular one is S6 these days, uh, but I have a screenshot for S4. Let me give an example, like how the how these dynamics go. Let's say there is a cell phone. Its procurement cost for the seller is $450. Assume demand curve is linear. At $1,000, nobody will buy it. But at zero, everybody wants one of it. Okay, And it's linear in between. Let's say if eBay is charging 10% uh, commission. You can compute that the optimal price the seller will sell will be $750. Then, because it's a linear demand curve, 25% of the buyers will purchase it. Uh, so eBay will make $75 per transaction, uh, and on a, each uh, uh, view, it will make $18.75, because 25% of this time of the transaction will happen. Seller will make uh, $225 per transaction, but on a each click basis, only uh, $56.25. If eBay were to switch its model to uh, per click, that means when you click and see the view the description of the cell phone, you go to the seller's page on eBay, uh, you pay a click price, but you don't pay any commission afterwards, whether you convert or not. It's your problem. Uh, so then the optimal price for the same uh, phone will be $725. Slightly more buyers will purchase it because it's cheaper. Uh, I, I normalized the number so that I kept the one thing equal. eBay is still making 1875, and the seller is making slightly more profit for each click. Uh, so the biggest difference happens, as you can see, is the consumer prices. So whenever you have a commission model, a part of that price goes to the uh, to the uh, buyer. And here are these uh, example screenshot. This is a watch on uh, eBay. The cost is uh, 2195 The same watch on the seller's own website is uh, 1895 Okay, So this seller is essentially transferring all the, uh, all the commission of eBay back to the uh, buyer. Now, what happens when you see this? So I did the uh, experiment together with uh, some of my interns. I think one was from Berkeley, uh, D. Wong. We looked at all the high-end watch sellers because there was so there was whatever the number of we can actually manually see each of them, call each of them, and all those things. Um, the watch seller of high-end who have their website or a sh physical shop, okay, who have a website or physical shop, um, were putting a lot of watches on eBay but selling almost zero because. There is an interest between both uh, uh, buyer and sellers to go off eBay and, uh, um, and, and do the transaction. So now they are uh, basically, we saw that in a, in a uh, commission model, consumer prices are higher. What it means is that it now encourages people to do the transaction outside of the platform. 
Okay, when people are doing transaction outside of the platform, the third implication is that uh, eBay will try to protect that thing by lowering the fee. The pricing structure would be lower because the, the lower the fee eBay charges, the lesser the incentive for people to go outside of platform is. So when eBay would do all these data analysis, et cetera, they will say, oh, our fee should be lower. Whereas the fault is, could be in certain categories, the, the business model side. Okay. I mean, and this happens on Amazon too. Um, let me skip. Uh, so you can um, analyze uh, similarly between Costco, let's say, and, and, and Best Buy, these two models. Costco is a membership model, Best Buy is a markup model. Uh, one problem which uh, uh, Best Buy has to deal with that people go and view the products on uh, uh, on uh, cost uh, sorry uh, Best Buy and then go and buy it online maybe at Amazon. Okay. Uh, so um, imagine like uh, uh, the following situation. Let's say eBay oh, sorry Best Buy and Sony are negotiating the price of a Sony TV, wholesale price, the supplier's price, and Costco and Sony are negotiating. And let's say, for conceptually, both have the same number of uh, volume. Let's say Costco sells a million TVs a month, uh, and uh, Best Buy sells a million TV a month. Now, the conceptually, who is going to get a uh, better price from the supplier? Would it be Costco or would it be Best Buy or would they get the same price because they have same the the same number of TV selling? Any any volunteer or guesses? Yeah. So it turns out that the Costco will get better price from the supplier. So it was uh, uh, due to basically um, uh, Costco. Why would Costco have a higher bargaining power? Because if Best Buy stops putting uh, Sony TV on its uh, shelf. If the, let's say you have to analyze the breakup point. Uh, if they fail a uh, deal between Best Buy and Sony, then what is the breakup point? If Best Buy doesn't put uh, Sony TV on its shelf, they, there will be some number of users who really want Sony TV, they will go to probably Fry's. Okay, let's say there was a million, maybe 700 people will go to Fry's and buy Sony TV. 200 people will buy maybe the Panasonic TV, and 100,000 uh, people decide not to upgrade their TV at this point. So on the other hand, Costco charges a membership fee. It is the only, and as a user, you are unlikely to be paying, participating in two different clubs. You may not be paying membership fee to Costco as well as Sam's Club, and you are getting a better deal at Costco. So when Costco stops keeping the Sony TV, the shift, from Sony to Panasonic will be much higher than uh, in, the, in the case of the um, Best Buy breaking the deal. Because Costco is probably the only um, source of uh, uh, cheap uh, Sony TV. Uh, so that has an implication for Amazon Prime. So many people say that Amazon Prime is actually um, losing money. Uh, people analyze all these. Uh, but if you account, don't account for the Number two, you will analyzing Amazon Prime incorrectly because Amazon is getting better bargaining power. There are people now who participate in Amazon Prime, they don't shop anywhere else. So if Amazon Prime doesn't have this product, you will buy something else. And that gives a tremendous bargaining power to Amazon. And, uh, and that reflects in, in their dealing with how they deal with their suppliers. Now, let me come to the second part of my talk in the next 10 minutes. This is uh, about home transactions. That's uh, this uh, company Fera does. Uh, so it's a online platform for uh, helping people buy and sell their homes. Okay. And uh, we use uh, several of the uh, economic principles I learned uh, from people in this room uh, here. So the question we were asking is, when we started this company, why is uh, home transactions still stuck in 20th century? Even the Uber is taking taxi rides into the 21st century. 
there are a lot of political answer, but let's not focus on that. <clears throat> I think the one answer is home transactions are risky for both buyers and sellers. They're large transaction. It's significant part of the, your life savings. And uh, so this risk, as I, sorry, this risk uh, implies uh, complexity. A typical home and purchase, purchase and sale contract for a typical home is about 10 plus pages. When you have such a complicated scenario, you need somebody hand holding. And that's where the cost is almost 10%. So there are three brokers typically involved in a home transaction, two realtors together charge six percentage, and there is a loan broker or loan officer uh, who charges 2.5%. And, and there are a bunch of other fees. So, so if a buyer pays half a million, you are going to get 450 uh, in your pocket. And why is this so complicated? So here is a typical purchase and sale agreement. You actually, when you sign a purchase and sale agreement, people who haven't purchased and sold home, here it, uh, how it goes. You sign a purchase and sale agreement, and then it says in 30 days we will close the sale. You, the buyer will give the money to the seller, and seller will give the home to the buyer. Okay. In that purchase sale agreement, that's one thing. The buyer will give the money to the seller, and seller will give home to the buyer. But then there is a bulk of the agreement is about the transaction failure. So every transaction can fail. If you, you bought, bought a computer at uh, Costco, you didn't like it, the transaction fails. That entire risk is taken by Costco because Costco is a uh, large uh, player. It can average out that risk. But here, both sides are individuals. Nobody actually can take that risk. So this makes it... Uh, uh, very hard and complicated. Who is going to take the risk of loan being failing? Who is going to take the risk of uh, uh, something, a die rod being discovered, or, or things like that? Uh, so typically you pay um, a good faith deposit, also called earnest money, or, or different things in different uh, geographies. You pay some money, hey, here's your $20,000 and I will purchase your or, or break a fee. If I don't end up buying this home, in certain condition, you can keep my breakup fee. Uh, but practically, it doesn't happen. Because if the seller is trying to keep that breakup fee, they cannot sell the home until they resolve the dispute. So really, that unless money should be called dispute. Whenever a transaction fails, if the transaction fails for known reasons, money is typically given to the buyers. If the transaction fails for uh, uh, reason for which sellers could have kept the money, such a transaction usually results in a dispute. What happens in a competitive situation, which is right now in many markets like Bay Area or even Seattle, they are like if you put a house, there are suddenly 10 possible buyers. Each one of them buys you. So if you allow contingencies in such a case, then what could happen that the winner intentionally bids high, win the house, and then negotiate the price down because he has a contingency. So that means in a competitive situation, you would not allow a contingencies. But if you don't allow a contingencies, then the risk for the buyers goes up significantly. Even the cost of bidding goes up. Many buyers will do pre-inspection. That's like somewhere between $500 to $1,000, uh, depending on the size of the house. Uh, so the cost of bidding goes up, then many buyers just walk away. So in either situation, you actually leave money on the table. So what FIRA does is the business model uh, it actually let this agreement, which is a, essentially a one-page agreement about the house, and then the, the second agreement with the transaction failure, it inserts itself in between. So there is no transaction failure agreement between the sellers and the buyer. It, everything goes through uh, FERA. And this simplifies actually everything. So now the seller's experience is straightforward. So the seller provides the home address. Everything is free to the sellers. All these, all the, the entire transaction. Then FERA will run the typical due diligence process, um, whatever the typical buyers run for. And uh, if the transaction fails, FERA will, compen FERA will compensate the seller, and seller is free to sell it to another buyer. Here is the buyer's ex uh, experience. So this is a home on sale on FERA. As you can see, you can find. Uh, all the due diligence documents uninfluenced by the seller. They are, the, they are done by FERA. 
and you can see whatever you want to see. So this is a new house. The otherwise say offer button uh, here. So you press the offer button, make whatever bid you want to make. Since everything is uh, here, the only thing you have to decide is the number. Are you willing to pay uh, whatever uh, money, five hundred thousand dollars? Just you press the button, type five hundred thousand, and uh, your offer is submitted within uh, thirty seconds. Wow. Here is the change in business model. There are a few uh, in innovation here. Uh, one is when buyers and sellers agree on a price, at that point, buyers pays half a percentage uh, to FERA. That's a FERA platform fee. There was no other uh, fee. There's no other cost to the seller or buyer. Now, since the buyer is paying this fee, this is completely non-refundable. Um, that represents the commitment from the buyer, so there is no earnest money. So remember, we shot that uh, uh, transaction failure between buyer and sellers and inserted fare in between. That's how we're inserting in between. There's no earnest money. And uh, the, after that, according to the purchase and sale agreement, in, within 30 days, buyer pays uh, the purchase price and seller gives the home. Okay. Sorry, uh, if I'm a bug, like, do you check the buyers? Um, we currently do not, and uh, we have seen, we will do it when we see in the data, the buyers, because it's a non-refundable half percent, uh, buyers are actually self basically discipline themselves. So if it fails, you still keep the 0.5? We keep the 0.5, except for the reasons um, which we provide. If it fails, let's say, we have done the pre-appraisal. If your loan is declined, because the house was not as much as you thought it is, then you will get this half percent. But if you fail the transaction because you lost your job, well, that's your problem. You should have a job uh, lost insurance. Uh, so we only cover the risk which is within the transaction. Okay. So if, if, if say something breaks in the house, it's better? Something like, between those 30 days, if something breaks the house? Is like liable. No, that, then the seller is liable. Then we will, in that case, we will refund the money to the buyer. So we will have a basically an objective. There's all the compensation to the buyer comes from us. All the compensation compensation to the seller comes from us for any kind of transaction failure. And there are scenarios where we will be actually issuing compensation to both at the same time. Uh, yeah. How many transactions have you been So we have done uh, on this platform. We have done two transactions. We had done uh, five manually without build, before building this platform. And in two transactions, we have served uh, 120 buyers and, and gotten feedback from them. Oh. So conceptually, now, okay, I, I need to say that. So you can actually show the working of the linkage principle here. Uh, that if the inspection reports are upfront, you can show that the uh, conceptually the seller is going to make more money. It's going to capture more buyers, and each buyer would be feeling less risk and will be willing to pay uh, offer more money. Uh, but conceptually, think of a purchase and sale agreement as a American call option, 30 days American call option. Uh, so once you sign a purchase and sale agreement, and I will buy this home for a half a million dollar uh, by certain date. That's an American call option. You, you, if you don't buy it, then you lose the premium, the half percent you paid. And this half percent is uh, the time value because it's typical in most geographies, it's the rent of the place. Okay. So this concept actually allows, so we have doing, uh, just implemented one version of it, but it allows the market to be more liquid. Suppose you are driving here and you see this home listed for, uh, um, I don't know the prices in Bay Area, but let's say $2 million. And you think, oh, geez, it should be cheaper. It's not going to sell. Uh, it should be 1.5. Currently, you don't have any way to provide that feedback to the market because you were anyway not willing, was buying it, and you are not buying it. So typically, this feedback that the price is overpriced comes much slower. The, the seller will be after three, four weeks, if there is no interest, will realize that, oh, maybe I'm, I, I should decrease the price by another 100K. And over like the several months, the, the price will come, come right and the home will sell. But if you treat uh, these contracts as a, uh, options, then 
it's it's conceptually possible for you to provide that feedback to the market by actually buying a put option on the house. Okay. Uh, so currently, actually, the, there's no way, but this this uh, this allows you to do. Uh, uh, this allows you to basically enrich and make this marketplace richer uh, for the home transaction for each home. And there are local investors who are always interested in uh, in in homes. It's being real estate. There's a lot of uh, interest there, so they can use it. So conclusion. Actually, we didn't see variety of business model. I skipped a number of them. Uh, so variety of, and uh, it's currently considered mostly as an art. Uh, you just uh, throw some ink on the, uh, yeah, and on, on blank paper and wish that something comes out. If it comes out, you think that you are smart. You are always knew this was the right thing, and if it doesn't come out, uh, okay, uh, too bad. So. But I think there is a scope of uh, making this uh, as uh, towards a little bit more science. So there are a uh, number of concepts. One can start uh, analyzing them. And uh, in, in particular, uh, when I was in Microsoft, I have a number of uh, situation uh, remember. So live search, uh, one of the brilliant idea many of Microsoft has had is that let's convert into a um, cost per acquisition rather than cost per click. And there was a lot of support, a lot of uh, outside consultancy. And uh, at that point, I did not know this theorem. But I still um, opposed that uh, cost per acquisition on the, uh, on the following ground. That if it's a cost per acquisition, uh, your uh, uh, advertisers are not taking any risk. So when you are seeking that, when should I show your ad? Should a uh, flower ad be shown to somebody who is looking for a car? The flower seller will sh show. So the, so the set of keywords will be uh, humongous by, for everybody. If it's a cost per acquisition, there's no harm in, in including. That was the, basically the only reason. Then people say, OK, but we can do machine learning. We can prevent all those things. Uh, possibly it can be done today, but possibly it wasn't. Nobody could do it at that point. And, and I'm glad Bing dropped the. It, was, it used to be called live search. It dropped the uh, cost per acquisition uh, uh, angle. But there's still certain segment where cost per acquisition could be uh, interesting. Uh, when I advertise on Google from Fera, we had a significant marketing budget. But uh, we, when we advertise on Google, we think that it's so dumb for Google to asking all this information because Google have far more data than we do have. The, the, the entire paradigm of uh, keyword and keyword bidding, it seems so outdated. So I took the part of the budget from Google and hired a person to help me do that. That money which should never have gone to outside Google is now going outside Google. Um, so there are scenarios where, uh, well, if you search, let's say, for pizza, there might be a good pizza joint here. But that guy only didn't know how to make best pizza. He doesn't know how to bid on Google. So all that bidding on Google will happen from Domino's, Papa Zones, and everything. And the people don't get to uh, see that uh, pizza joint ad. Uh, so that's all. And any questions? Thank you.